Lev, I want to thank you for uh, this uh, great uh, presentation of, uh, of the Safe Justice paper. I think um, there's a lot of work done and uh, what we see, and I hope um, behind this table there are a lot of people who have personal experience, but also experience in, in their work with victims and what they need. So I really hope that we can... Uh, can go on and uh, and and make the steps who are so important for uh, for victims especially when they come in a criminal procedure i must say when i was introduced i, I worked for for a lifelong time as, as a judge and um uh, and and i like the work but uh, i had also a lot of contact with with um uh, victims and, and relatives of of victims and of course not the one who were in, in front of me, but um, with a lot of people in uh, in other cases. And for me, there was always a big difference between sitting in a court and um, for one day or sometimes for a couple of weeks and looking in the eyes every day um, uh, of victims and relatives, because I think that's the only way when you really understand what's going on and where they go through. And also, um, that's the same in criminal procedures, if I, uh, if I may say so. So I think that the Safe Justice paper give good ideas about what, what has to be done in, in court. But I think we really need people who are very brave to do it, because I, th I, I, I often hear now on this moment that we need new legislation and we need this and we need that, but it's also possible that you are just brave as a judge because you can do a lot um, for victims in court when you just do it. I remember that 20 years ago we we didn't have the right of speech in court in, in the Netherlands, but some of us did because uh, you are the one who uh, who gives order in a courtroom so when you decide and all the parties agree you can do it you don't need all this big legislation for this so um, i think that's very important to uh, to realize that uh, that's all the time and that's why it's so important that we talk about and to end we have this discussion i stop now because there are m more important and people behind this uh, this table and uh, together um, they will tell you about their own experiences and I hope that they take elements of the safe justice paper with them in their uh, in their speech and the first one who um, who I give the floor is is Joan Joan Dean she's sitting right to me and um, Joan came really personal involved in uh, in victims rights following the murder of your son Russell or so if I understand and uh, uh, you founded an organization called ADVIC, mm -hmm. and that's an organization who advocates for the victims of, uh, of homicide. And uh, I hope you, uh, you can tell us more about your personal experience and what we can do and what has to be done. Joan, please take the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Rosa. Good afternoon, everyone. I... Um, as Rosa said, um, my experience with the criminal justice system began when my son was killed, and that was in 2003. Hello? No. Hello? No? Is that better? It's very low. Yeah. Okay. Well, I. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so change it. <laughs> um, yeah, my experience began in 2003. Following the, the, the murder of my son, um, and that happened two weeks after the breakup of a relationship, he, the, the brother and two friends of the girl he broke up with broke into his house and attacked him with weapons they picked up from his garden shed. Um, that began, as you can imagine, I, I don't need to, to, I'm sure, tell anybody what a nightmare experience that was and what a an absolute devastation it was for my family. Um, 
I suppose we thought that was the worst thing that had ever happened to us. And so it was. But we didn't realise that we were now embarking on a journey into the criminal justice system that would be equally as devastating in it for many different reasons. I suppose I can say we were lucky and maybe luckier than, than some in that a lot of our contact with the, the agencies of the criminal justice system were positive, quite positive. We had very good um, contact from the, the Gardaí in our country, the police. Um, they were very supportive, very, very helpful. I suppose the, the first difficulty we encountered would have been the time frame. Um, it was two years before the case came to trial and there were three, the three young men were charged with murder. The, for various reasons, the, there were various complications during the, the, the trial period and we ended up having three separate trials. Um, I won't go into the details now, but I'm happy to answer questions if anybody wants to, to delve into it. There were mostly legal legal issues that caused collapse of two uh, the first trial. The second trial, um, one young man was acquitted because he didn't strike a blow, although he was part of the, the common design. The brother of the girl that my son had broken up with was found guilty of manslaughter, and that was okay. And the jury came back and to ask a question of the judge, and for some inexplicable reason, he dismissed them. So that led to the third trial. And at the, that, that was bad enough, but that all took another 18 months to happen. So there were huge delays in between. And at that trial, the, the final guy, who I believe was the, the main instigator of the, the attack, um, was found guilty of manslaughter, which felt like a huge injustice to us. It, it was... Um, it, it, it seemed really a wrong verdict, but we, we were told we have to accept the verdict of, of a jury. Um, the DPP did offer to appeal it, but at that stage, you know, to, to paraphrase the New Zealand Prime Minister, we had nothing left in the tank to go again. It just, it didn't matter to me almost at that stage because I had, by then, I had dismissed them in my head those people don't exist for me anymore. Um, so th that was basically um, the, the bones of it. But I think the real injustice during those trials was one defence team seemed to have a game plan that included getting me out of that courtroom for whatever reason. Um, at each of the trials, when... A, the first one, it first happened when the weapon was produced suddenly out of a bag and I reacted and left the courtroom because I knew I was going to cry. And when I came back in, this defence team was on their feet asking the judge to collapse the trial because I was trying to influence the jury. Now, at that point, I was new to the criminal justice system. I didn't even know you could do that. So um, he didn't collapse the trial for that reason. But then at each of the subsequent trials, they closely monitored my reactions by standing at the edge of the pew where I was sitting. And any time a tear appeared on my face, they were looking to collapse the trial. And to be fair to the judge, three different judges, they didn't accede to, to their, their uh, demand at any time and told them more or less to get real. What did they expect the mother of um, a victim to do from time to time? So that, that was a huge, that had a huge impact on me. And I'm not a nervous Nelly, but that made me really, really nervous. And I was terrified to move a muscle in case I could collapse the trial. Um, it meant there were periods when I couldn't be in the courtroom because I knew there might be sensitive information about the injuries my son had. And I couldn't risk causing the trial to collapse. Um, you talk about... Um, safe justice. I felt that was very unsafe. But after the trials were finished, I did write to the Law Society to make a complaint because I felt it was completely unnecessary and nobody should have to, you know, go through that sort of thing. 
And the reply I received from them was that they couldn't accept the complaint because I had not employed this the solicitor. The state had employed him. So no voice whatsoever, simply because I, I hadn't employed him. But it had a, a very profound impact on, on us. Um, you mentioned Advoc um, shortly after even before the trials happened, shortly after my son was killed, I felt a need to, a strong need to meet another family who had been through the same thing. Um, I contacted what was then Victim Support in Ireland and I did meet some other families. And we, we I suppose we had a very similar outlook. On, they'd all been through the same thing and were at different stages of their journey. But we, we strongly felt that the system was very unbalanced and was weighted heavily in favour of the, the, the accused. And we felt there were aspects of it that didn't need to be like that, that it could be recalibrated. And so we, we set up EPIC and we, we began to work with the agencies in the criminal justice system to, for change, to advocate for change. But of course, change comes very slowly. And um, while you know we we did we did manage to you know get through to to people, and we found them very positive in their response to us. But what was lacking was empathy. I think um, in theory, you know, the, the information existed, but nobody seemed to realise that a victim, a traumatised victim, is doesn't even know how to go about finding the information. In fact, you don't even know what you need to know at a certain point. So the first thing we did was gather all of the information together in a website and a booklet, and that was the first thing we did. The We, we don't... You mentioned earlier, Lev, about leaflets... Um, during the time immediately after my son was killed, somebody called to my house with a big bag of leaflets. And I, w I was really taken aback by it and very suspicious about it at that stage because all of your, your whole sense of security is gone um, at that point. And it was, in, in fact, it was a very well-intentioned volunteer who was working, you know, with victim support but it was a cold call and I just felt this, this is not the way to do it. So in Advic, we never, we never contact people. We don't reach out. We, we work with the, the guards, the, the, the guardie, and we give them the information. And when the family is ready, they come to us and we help them as much as we can. We, we, we help them access um, support at court, I think, which is a very important service. Certainly it existed in Ireland when, when I was going through the courts. And without those, those volunteers who were able to explain to me what was happening, I didn't even know what a courtroom looked like, you know. So they, they, from the very basic, they take you through the courtroom, they show you everything, they explain what's going on. When legal arguments were happening, they were able to explain, don't panic, you know, this happens. Um, they even were able to provide a room, which was at that time the judge's dressing room, where we could have a cup of tea or a cup of coffee or whatever. So hugely important. And I know that in Ireland, certainly, the support at court uh, people have become very sophisticated now and they have dedicated victim suites, etc. Um, in Advic, I think one of the main queries we get from people is around the area of criminal injuries compensation. It, oh God, it's, where do you even start with it? I think it's a problem in every country, but for us, it, it, it's a, up to now, it was on a non-statutory footing. And it is so complex and so complicated. You have to download the application form online and it's a 24 page application form. It is the clunkiest, densest legal document or, you know, application form. It's really terrible. And I think you have to do that whether your bike has been stolen 
or somebody has been murdered or you've been raped. It's the same application. And we believe that, you know, homicide and rape should be dealt with separately. You know, it, it's just not enough to, you know, fill in a form with your name and your numbers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think you need human contact to, to um, be able to convey... Uh, convey your, your, your distress and your, your situation and for them to understand the trauma you're going through. So I think serious training is needed around that whole area. Now we do have, um, we have a really uh, progressive justice minister in Ireland at the moment. Um, she's on maternity leave currently, but she really has made a lot of um, changes and she's suggested a lot of changes. Not all of them have been implemented but she's doing really, really well. And she has recommended a review of the Criminal Injuries Compensation Tribunal. Um, I thought change had happened there. I could not establish it from their website. So I thought, I'll ring them up and I'll speak to them because that's the best way to find out. And the phone number, which is on their website, is out of service. <laughs> so access is very difficult i don't know how you do it at the moment i'll have to follow that one up when i go back it um so i think training they, they did reach out to um some organizations for um input into their training program and we did um provide very complex um training suggestions to them but they didn't come back to us and um i don't know what i don't know where that's at at the moment so I'm not very hopeful that things will change um, very quickly there. The, the, the guards are very open to change and they're very open to listening to the voice of the victim. Um, and I know sometimes it's not easy to maybe for an organization to deal with individual victims, but they could liaise with the NGOs who work with victims on the ground because those are the people who, who can relay real situations, real life situations. It, um, I think education is another important um, area and certainly following um, homicide, uh, we, 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 we are working on developing a schools program where we hope to go into schools and talk to young, young men in particular um, about the, the effects of violent action and homicide and, and death and all of that and how it affects family life because they're young, they don't understand and they're maybe watching social media which gives them a very warped um, sense of how women can be treated and even other men can be treated um, and I think that has to be countered with positive education. We're also developing a digital program, a digital support program um, which we're going to launch uh, next week. Um, it's called Beat the Blues. It's, it's, um, it's an online CBT uh, program for 16-year-olds upwards. And we're just working on another one, which is for younger children from, I think, the age of 12 to 16. And that one will be, it, it's like an online game because children of that age are su such digital natives um, where they, they really may not be able to sit down in front of a counsellor. And we're finding it difficult enough to find specialist child counsellors. Um, I suppose the single... Am I nearly there? Yes. Okay, I'll, I'll finish now. Well, well, people who, who tell me that uh, okay, I have to okay, stop you, I'll, but it's okay. so interesting to listen to you. Can I have, can I have one, minute. Yes, one minute? One minute. Thanks. I think one very important change that we, we definitely have been banging the drum about for a lot of years... Um, is that we need in Ireland either a victim's ombudsman or a victim's commissioner. We need this one-stop shop where victims can go to get information um, where they, they will be listened to and where they can bring a complaint if their rights are breached. Um, it hasn't got any traction so far, but we will keep banging that drum and hopefully it will happen one day. So thank you.
Thank you, Joan. I, uh, I think uh, in a quite constructive way you, uh, you describe your experiences and uh, I think it's good that we are here together because there's a lot of work to be done, but uh, also happy to see that things happen even when it goes very, very slow. Shall we see if there are two questions on this moment? Later on we have a little bit more time, but sometimes you have such an urgent question that you think, I want to ask it now. Is there someone who has an urgent question on this moment? No? None? Oh, later on we, we, we go we'll go on, but it's just that I don't want to uh, to let you uh, be with your own question. Then I go to uh, to Ekram. Uh, Ekram Kubanich Bekov. I, I practice, is that a good pronunciation? <laughs> yes, yes, thank you. He's a uh, senior advocacy officer and uh, he's working for ILGA uh, Europe and uh, he develops and implement an, implements uh, advocacy strategy and policies initi initiatives to bring legal, political and social change for the LGBTI group. And I think you can tell more about this uh, to us. Please take yes, the floor. Uh, thank you. Uh, for introduction, uh, I would like to start uh, to begin with how uh, safe justice looks for LGBTI person in the example of uh, journey of one uh, victim of the crime, and it's an ideal uh, which might be kind of a unicorn world, uh, not existent. Uh, at least I didn't hear in my experience that this kind of scenario happened. Uh, so we could imagine that uh, there's a transgender woman who is physically assaulted by a group of individuals because uh, who uh, she is and uh, you, you don't have to imagine because it's happening every day. Uh, and then uh, what's the next step is that because campaign uh, by the government on the rights of the victim is always uh, happening and she's aware of her rights and she goes to report the crime to the police and I there she's provided with the information about her rights and uh, the support services available to her and including the option to seek medical attention, counseling, uh, mental health support. Uh, and next step is that police uh, take reports seriously and investigate the crime, gather evidence and identify the perpetrators and all the time victim is kept informed about the progress of the investigation and is provided with the support throughout the process, uh, including safety planning and emotional support, which uh, Levent was talking, it's uh, right to protection. And uh, then cases then refer to the prosecutor and who works with the victim and to prepare her uh, for the trial and ensures that her rights are protected throughout the uh, uh, process. And the prosecutor also seeks to enhance uh, the punishment uh, for uh, for the crime, uh, specifically because this crime was based on victims' gender identity and uh, perpetrator had the discriminatory motive. Uh, uh, the, and, and then trial proceeds smoothly and the victim is able to testify uh, and uh, provide evidence uh, without fear of uh, retribution and discrimination. Uh, and then uh, she also receives compensation. Uh, uh, and then following the trial, the uh, victim is also provided with the support to recover uh, from the crime and its impact, including ongoing counseling and access to victim support services. The police and prosecutor also work to ensure that victim is not subjected to any further victimization or discrimination, including any harassment or retaliation from the perpetrators or uh, their associates, uh, even though perpetrators can end up uh, behind the bars, usually associate can also uh, pose the threat uh, to victims of crime. So uh, overall, this is the example of how an LGBTI, in this case, uh, trans person can access safe justice, uh, including support and protection they uh, need to report the hate crime, uh, participate in the criminal justice process, and recover from the crime. And uh, most importantly, the victim is treated with dignity and respect throughout the process, and their rights are protected by the criminal justice system. And uh, as uh, it was also highlighted by the Philippe, uh, that they are reintegrated back uh, to their uh, life uh, be before uh, they face the, uh, face the crime. 
but however, uh, there are lots of challenges uh, faced uh, by the LGBTI victims of crime uh, in their journey to uh, achieve safe justice. Uh, so this can include, and it's not uh, only limited, but there's also other barriers, but I will stop on some of them. Uh, the one is the fear of reporting. Uh, LGBTI victims of uh, crime may be afraid to report incidents to the police, particularly in those countries where the discrimination uh, is widespread and stigma exists against LGBTI community because police is also part from the community and they also share sometimes the prejudice the, uh, the wider uh, public has. And this uh, fear may be based on the past negative experiences uh, with authorities or lack of the uh, trust in the criminal justice or lack uh, of the information about their rights, uh, just to name a few. Uh, the second barrier or challenges is the lack of uh, awareness and understanding. Uh, so some uh, police officer and criminal justice professionals may not have adequate training on how to work with LGBTI victims of crime and this can also often result in insensitivity or lack of understanding uh, of the unique challenges uh, they face by the victims. Uh, and then it, uh, there's also secondary victimization when they finally report by the, uh, by the police or other authorities. So victi uh, victims may feel uh, re-traumatized or experience secondary victimization during the reporting process or as their case uh, processes through the criminal justice system. And uh, this can occur if the uh, victim feels that they are not being taken seriously, which is actually uh, uh, one of the top uh, replies why they, they do not report. Because uh, when you don't prosecute one or t uh, take serious uh, one reported crime, then what people do, you share with your family, you share with your friends that I reported, but nothing is happening. Then, if your friend will happen to be a victim of the crime, then of course you will remember about that story and then you don't report. Uh, and secondary victimization is not only about incorrect questions or uh, etc., but in cases of uh, example, transgender women, but police often, we hear that police often also misgender if they didn't uh, also go through the uh, legal gender recognition and which already uh, uh, strip them from their dignity. Uh, so these are uh, some of the examples. Uh, and of course, uh, there's also limited access to support services. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, there was also, we, he we heard a lot about access of uh, trans people specifically, and in this case, transgender uh, women of uh, domestic violence being denied from the uh, single gender shelters and uh, they couldn't access and they couldn't go anywhere, they were on the streets. Uh, so these are the some of the, uh, um, yeah, and then, uh, so if they also often do not go uh, to the, uh, they don't have also counseling, legal assistance, uh, but I think it's not unique for only LGBTI, but it's uh, as we he hear from the other testaments that uh, this exists uh, when it comes to all victims of uh, crime. Uh, and uh, also further in the criminal justice system, uh, there's also discrimination and they can face discrimination not only from, for, from police officers, but prosecutors Prosecutors sometimes treat hate crimes just, just uh, uh, ordinary crimes and do not take uh, bias motivation of the perpetrator uh, or even if prosecutors take, then judge uh, doesn't take. So it continues, uh, goes on, uh, and uh, this discourages LGBTI people to actually to go and uh, try to access justice. Uh, so that's why it's important to address these challenges by providing adequate support, training, and also resources to ensure that LGBTI victim victims of uh, crime can access safe justice, uh, and uh, also to to just go uh, go forward so that uh, the example I gave from the very beginning will become reality. So thank you for your attention.
I look to the audience um, and maybe the online audience, I don't know. But does anyone has a question on this in this moment to Akram? Yes, I see a hand over there. Hello, uh, my name is Amin Hashmi. I'm a journalist from Europe and uh, Africa. I'm Algerian. And uh, we are also proud uh, to promote our International Day of Living Together in Peace, the 16th of May, who was voted in the United Nation. My question was, is, uh, is there really uh, justice for victims in Europe? Because for our, our case, example, in Algeria and France, it was a lot of problems of colonialism. And until today, because they signed agreement, agreement of Evian, uh, we can't go against France or what's happened in the colonist time because it's a, a law. Uh, in the period of terrorism, uh, Europe helped us. Uh, I'm speaking uh, like journalists. It was 100 journalists killed in Algeria. And we come here uh, in the heritage of Europe and they tell us, we will help you. And uh, they promise us 5 million euro and we're still waiting because it was voted, we never receive it. And the problem of this case, they tell to me, you know, I mean, it's 16 billion of uh, shift of affair between Europe and uh, Algeria, then it's not easy to help journalists. And this is a shame, because today they ask Africa to support what's happened against this terrible war with Ukraine and Russia. And we, we admit we need to stop this war but Europe is all time playing ostrich. Then it means they know there is problems. They know there is still uh, victims. But they, with the law, they sign an engagement to no go far away. Today, Belgium, you know, uh, the different uh, office and the prime minister also, they are condemned because they didn't help victims of war. It's true, they are not European. They are from Syria, they are from Afghanistan or others. But today, the members of the prime minister will be seized by the, uh, the law because he did, didn't do anything. Then today my question is, is there really a justice in Europe and we can share this model of justice? I know the justice is free in Europe. That is, uh, I'm proud to say that. And, and Africa is not free. Then if for you, there is a possibility, really, to act in justice for victims. Okay, thank you very much. Igram, I don't know if it's a question for uh, for you, or, but, or for one of the others. Uh, Levin? Sure. Um, I can't answer the question in that way, uh, and I'm certainly not a, an expert in global social, economic, and other kinds of politics. Some of the things that you say, though, it, it, all, it still comes back to the same concepts, really, because how are these decisions being made, why are they being made, and how are they being implemented, and, and where do you think about the victims within that process? So, as a general rule, do, can we get justice in Europe? Yes. We have amongst the most effective justice systems in the world across our member states. Are there large numbers of problems with with you know the normal level of criminal justice yours is a is another level of issue yes there are still problems what what your point reminds me of is some of the struggles where there has been conflict and and for the uk we've we've had the uh, the troubles in northern ireland for example um we, we've had the difficulties in spain and there are other examples as well what it reminds me of is the, the reconciliation processes and, and where you have to make very difficult decisions as, as states and governments um, about how you go forward. And I can't say what the right answer is, but what I can certainly say is that when you don't involve victims in that process and, and don't take them along with you in that process, you can't really get effective reconciliation. And I think that's the kinds of concerns that, that we see coming up now with, with, with the decisions in the UK and with respect to the Northern Ireland. And it sounds similar uh, uh, with respect to Algeria. It's, it, this should be, if it's victim sensitive, if, it's, if it has this safe justice concept behind it, decisions may not go your way, but you should be part of the process and be heard 
uh, within that. Has that happened? I'm sure in many cases it's not, but that's really, these principles are, are not just about criminal proceedings, they're, they're really about our social cohesion as a society and how we engage uh, across borders as well. Thank you. I look around. Does one of the others want to give a reaction? Then I go on with you. I see a hand. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm Larissa. I'm from Institute from European Studies. Th this question will be maybe for Akram more. Uh, I'm just curious to know how much um, the court are applying framework of intersectionality to maybe better uh, explain to all is like uh, intersection of multiply of discrimination and uh, how you deal with that because it's not like the same level of someone having the just one discrimination let's say and uh, forming uh, multiply discrimination in one person so if you need further explanation i'm here yes thank you uh, so intersectional approach uh, is when for example they mentioned uh, in my example, mentioned trans woman happens to be also a uh, migrant and engaged in sex work, then she would have more than one, uh, three. Uh, and all, uh, so she could suffer, it, um, for example, attack based on that she was, to begin with, engaged in sex work, second trans uh, person, and then third, uh, she was a migrant, so there would be a mix of the uh, biased motives. And in this case, with the courts, we hear rarely because uh, it depends, to begin with, it depends from the uh, like police that they record uh, uh, the biased motives uh, uh, correctly and uh, hear. Uh, and then they pass to the prosecution and prosecution also uh, takes all these three uh, biased motives and ask for the aggravation uh, of the penalty or uh, um, and then it up to the judge, but we even uh, in most cases we even do not uh, reach to the cert to the judiciary uh, when judges will decide. But we end up uh, that police do not take into account because they they don't think that it's serious, or uh, they don't have system how to record it. Uh, but in many member states in the EU they do actually have, but even if they have, they usually it's a one uh, bias. Uh, so I think it, it's the area which should be improved and we hope uh, actually with the extension of the EU crimes to include hate crime and hate speech that uh, EU uh, legislator or co-legislators will come up also will consider how to how to uh, record and how to address this uh, hate crimes by, based on the intersection of ident uh, on intersectional identities as well. So thank you. I hope that I answered the question. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions on this moment? See another finger. Can it be a short question? Yes. Because Very short question for Mr. Akram. Yes. Uh, it was a pleasure to me to make uh, with the Vice President of Europe an interview about what's happened in Qatar. And uh, I would like to know, because for us also the world is a weapon. And uh, in these uh, football games, everybody know it was forbidden to show her uh, LGBT of her, his uh, his gender. Uh, what was the, your position about uh, the victim? How how we can also help the victim who was since it was not uh, a law, and uh, Europe and the world don't say anything. I'm proud of my Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, Haj al Habib, who did. I'm proud of the minister from Germany. She also did something. I'm proud of our people who they tried to put this love. What was the position of Ilga? And do you think we can do something? Because today, after the Qatar gate, I think it's time to Europe to act. Um, th thank you for this. Uh, I think it's more question to my colleagues who are working on the broader kind of with the political, uh, specifically po political issues. Uh, and we uh, happen to be actually do have uh, publication on the specific on this issue on our website. And I'm happy to share with you if uh, after the meeting I can have your email and reply uh, officially. Uh, I think I hope that it answers the question. Thank you for the question. 
Okay, please. Um, do we have a mic? Yes. I have uh, I have a question for Mr. Kubanish Bekov. Yes, I'm sorry I don't speak fluently English. Then I I will ask you my question in French. Ah. Oui, ça va. Merci. J'ai euh, j'ai moi-même été victime à plusieurs reprises de crimes de haine en tant que personne transgenre, et j'ai à chaque fois à chaque fois euh, par principe, porter plainte auprès de la police. Et j'ai constaté... Donc, euh, je disais, je répète, oui, j'ai été à plusieurs, oui, à plusieurs reprises victime de, de haine, de crimes de haine à mon égard en tant que personne transgenre. As a uh, sorry, as a Transgender person, I've been several times victim of hate crime. Et euh, je tiens à souligner le fait que, au niveau de de l'accueil de la police, de la prise en charge, il y a encore beaucoup de travail à faire. I would like to say that um, there is much more to be done uh, from the police in terms of uh, reporting the crime and being welcome in the station. Car pour moi, personnellement, la base, la base, quand on on subit une agression, transphobe, homophobe, la base, c'est déjà l'accueil. L'accueil et la, le sentiment de protection que nous inspire la police. Pour moi, le plus important, c'est ce sentiment de sécurité de la police et la façon dont ils nous accueillent dans la station. Dans mon cas personnel, ça a été chaque fois l'indifférence, un peu d'arrogance, mais surtout, surtout, l'indifférence. For me, the most difficult was the, I'm not sure in English, indifférence, indifference, <laughs> and the lack of uh, recognition. En ce qui me concerne, je parle au mon nom et au nom des, de mes amis qui ont été confrontés à la même situation. I speak under, for my name and on behalf of all my friends who've been uh, confronted to this situation. Et là où je voudrais m'adresser à monsieur, c'est en ce qui concerne le dépôt de plainte. J'ai à plusieurs reprises déposé plainte auprès de la police pour des agressions transphobes. Uh, my question is for Akram because I've been several times going to the police to report crimes. Et ce qui est étonnant, c'est que mes plaintes à plusieurs reprises ont été classées comme des plaintes comme des agressions non pas transphobes ou homophobes, mais comme des agressions racistes. And several times my uh, claims were uh, filed as uh, uh, racist and not tran trans transphobic crimes, ag aggressions. J'ai euh, donc j'ai fait part de mon étonnement, euh, donc de mon étonnement aux personnes qui étaient responsables de la prise en charge et de la rédaction du PV. I expressed my uh, Uh, surprised to the to the police officers who are writing the complaints. En leur expliquant que, qu'en ce qui me concerne, il ne s'agissait pas d'agression raciste, mais d'agression transphobe. Quand je dis raciste, c'est dans mon cas personnel, mes agressions étaient causées par des des jeunes hommes euh, d'origine maghrébine. Je précise que je suis également moi-même d'origine maghrébine. Uh, for me personally, these, these aggressions against me were uh, about transphobia and not ra racism, and the people who attacked me were from Maghreb, and uh, I'm also from Maghreb. Et donc j'ai euh, donc j'ai j'ai attiré l'attention du à chaque fois des personnes qui étaient pris euh, qui étaient responsables de la prise en charge de mon PV en leur expliquant qu'il ne pouvait pas s'agir d'agression raciste étant donné que moi-même et mes euh, mes euh, comment dire mes agresseurs, tout à fait, étions des mêmes origines. So I explained to the police officer that for me it couldn't be considered as a racist aggression because I had the same background uh, as my offenders. Et donc ma question, est-ce que est-ce que cette manière de classer les agressions au lieu de donc de les classer en tant qu'agression 
transphobes, mais de les, de les classer en tant qu'agression raciste, cela n'est pas fait dans un but bien précis. Uh, is this approach of uh, classifying uh, an aggression or crime as a racist rather than transphobic, isn't it something that is made on purpose? With a specific goal? That's my, that's my question. Um, thank you very much. I truly cannot uh, really answer if it was the intent or they consider it that you have more chance uh, with the classifying crime like that. Uh, so without being there, it's hard to uh, really establish what was the intention behind. But uh, by ideally, as I said, uh, so... Uh, police should recognize um, that uh, it was uh, hate motivated by the transphobia and not for by the racism. And uh, ideally, they should, uh, even if they had that it, it might be, they consider it if it was racist. And if you uh, said that no, it was a transphobic attack, then they should uh, record boss as in the previ previous question. So boss and address uh, and work on bo both of them. Uh, but it, it may also c happen, uh, so we can here definitely see like uh, inappropriate classification. You also mentioned that uh, about secondary victimization, that that was uh, also like arrogant uh, and other kind of um, uh, attitude from the police. And this specifically says about the lack of awareness uh, from the criminal justice system about uh, LGBTI people and what kind of uh, specific challenges they face. Uh, for example, transphobia is not the same as racism. Uh, and uh, this is uh, maybe because it's the lack of, from the lack of understanding that uh, this was a message uh, specifically to you and to the wider community in this in, in this crime, if it was specifically hate crime, uh, and uh, so this is one one of the examples actually of the how system fail LGBTI people uh, uh, to uh, to be seen, to be heard, and also to provide protection. Uh, I don't know about what what happened further, but uh, this is one. Your is the one of the very sad examples of how criminal justice system treats LGBT people. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Yes. Just just to add something to just this. Just short. To short, but it, it, it's really <laughs> about the complexity of the response. This is why safe justice is a is a comprehensive system. You, you, you can be talking about lack of knowledge, poor behavior, uh, personal biases, all of those things. No one, no one action will resolve everything. That's why you need the training to achieve behavior change. But you also need the tools to address poor behavior. You need the legal remedies and ability of a victim to complain when something isn't done right. Uh, you need also to have the accompaniment. When someone is accompanied by, by victim support professionals or a lawyer, the treatment, especially when you're a vulnerable victim in certain kinds of situations, um, like in this situation, you're treated differently when you're accompanied by a professional. So it's this combination which is essential. Do you see they, they show us it. all these plates? <laughs> But uh, thank you, uh, thank you, thank you, Alef, because I think the most important thing, I think, when we listen to all these questions is that we can conclude that the criminal procedure is becoming quite uh, complicated. And, and that's what we hear from, from all victims, that when you don't have the good support, not only emotional, but also legal, judicial, um, it's very difficult to get into this, um, uh, how do you call it, um, uh, yeah, area because because you have you need so much for example you can ask for protection protection measures and that kind of things but when you don't know you're sitting there uh, most of the time it's it's a one of, of second time that it happens to you and then it's very difficult to uh, to to make the right step that's i think why it's so important that we have the the safe justice uh, paper because there's also described that you really need uh, yeah, assistant from people who have been uh, experienced and trained in this area. Je pense qu'il concerne dans mon cas moi personnel, j'ai euh, j'ai dû insister, insister pour qu'on réintitule la plainte, qu'on la réadapte, non pas en tant qu'agression raciste, 
Mmh. Mais agression transforme. Mmh. J'ai dû insister pour la dernière agression qui s'est passée au mois d'août. J'ai dû vraiment insister. Pour les précédents, c'est resté agression raciste. Yeah. And if you understood, she had to insist herself yeah. to have it changed. Yes. But I, I think that's also, it's, it. I mean, there is something where you are able to do that as an individual and have the courage and the ability to do that, but so many others don't, and that's part of the problem. Yeah. And they never come back at the police station, and that's so pity, you know. In a lot of cases, um, you see that crime is going down, but in fact, most of the cases are never investigated or prosecuted. So, so, and and I think when you talk about victims, then you have really victimization and second secondary vic victimization. Okay, thanks for your question. I go to uh, to Philip. I think you don't need an introduction now because we have spoken to you already. But maybe it's good that you tell your story out of your personal experience uh, on this moment. Is that a good idea? Yes, 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 please. Right. Okay. Go. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Personal experiences. I mean, um, in my case, so I lost my sister on the twenty second of March, like two thousand sixteen. So soon it's going to be uh, seven years. Um, it's always it always remains difficult. Um, we have another prosecution going on. Uh, we have ups and downs. Uh, as victim, you can feel uh, really good uh, right now and, and bad in five minutes or vice versa. Uh, and so I hear a couple of times uh, saying here that uh, we need to have this uh, human contact. And I think this is extremely important. Um, often on the legal side and also uh, from society in general, uh, the people who are putting into place all the, the the support, which is really necessary, it's fundamental, uh, often they don't talk the same language as the victims uh, themselves, because the victims are, um, again, yeah, rebuilding themselves, the, 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 the values might be a little bit different, so this human contact is extremely important, and it also, and this is a difficulty uh, in our society, is providing the time to the victims uh, too often the victims have no time to rebuild themselves because it's just not feasible. Uh, often victims are uh, affected also uh, financially. Uh, they have uh, costs, uh, debts or whatever, and so they are obliged to, to continue. And this is even more the case, even I have to say this, for women. Uh, when a woman is a victim, uh, often when she has children, uh, she has so much burdens, the children they can't wait, they have to be fed every day, they have to go to school, the, who will take all these, um, these roll over? Uh, so I would say for a woman, the time uh, is, is even more important because she can't stop, she can't stop even 24 hours. Uh, and so how she's gonna rebuild herself? Uh, this is something I also wanted to touch base. And then we've got also, of course, the children, children who are victim. Uh, this is something extremely difficult. We all want that these people can, these children have the right support uh, so that they can, they can become grown up adults uh, who, who can really reintegrate society. Um, so these are two points I, I also I want to touch base. We often see also with decision makers, and now I'm talking about the politicians, that they have a hearing, but they don't want to start to do the proper work because it's too expensive. Um, but okay, it's maybe too expensive in their terms as an elected politician, but in the long run, it's gonna be more, even more expensive if you don't do it properly. So it's better to, to install a right system that uh, provides the, 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 the possibility for the victims to rebuild themselves, uh, find resilience, reintegrate society, have justice to be done in the right way. Uh, okay, it's gonna be expensive, but if you do it properly, these people again uh, become part uh, of society. Uh, if you don't do it properly, these people will suffer post-trauma and, and so on and so on and it's going to be a huge cost on the social system uh, of the member states. So for me, justice is there, 
justice is about the law, it's about society, the message we give to society, but of course it's also about victims. They're all equally important. And if you provide the right support to the victims and bring them in the right spot, then uh, in fact what you're doing, you're combating injustice in the right way. And that's what we need to do. Personal experience. And look around. Is there anyone who want to ask a question to, to Philip or to someone else? Yes, please. If we need a mic. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Paola Grenier. I'm from the Validity Foundation. We, we work on disability rights. And um, I've been working for the past few years on the rights of people with disabilities who are victims of crime, um, who really experience some of the most challenging circumstances i've heard so much about the the experiences people people here today which is really um hugely challenging but i hear about people with disabilities who can't even get into a police station who don't even have a telephone to report um, a crime on who when they do make a report are called weird um are told that they um are not credible witnesses or they um uh, cannot be interviewed because where's their guardian? Um, whose guardian is then somebody who may actually be the perpetrator of the crime. Um, and in our analysis and our thinking on this, um, we came to the idea that there's a lot of power play going on here. Um, and I just want to quote that one of our, our, our consultants, um, uh, he, when he was supporting us in our work, um, he made this statement about uh, the justice system and its symbols are scary. In most places, courts are not about justice, they are about power. For anyone facing these symbols of power, it's disabling. Start, with think, start by thinking about defocusing that power. The focus should be on justice. It's about the humanization of the justice system itself. And I just really wondered if you have some thoughts or ideas about that more explicit notion of the, we know the power relations and the power that the different players in the legal system have, um, not only over victims, it feels like. And so I just was asking for your, your, some of your responses to that. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. I, yes, Beth? Um, yeah. Uh, yes, I think I think there's lots of lots of evidence of that in in the experiences, not just of victims with disabilities, but many victims in many ways. But I th I think it intersects with all sorts of other aspects of you know who has control, how easy is the system, what are you trying to achieve from the system as well. So th th this, I think about the movement from having the gowns and the wigs and everything else because the because people feel and judges and others felt that you have to have this level of austerity within the justice system to demonstrate to the accused the seriousness of the um, situation um, and I think these are really good things to examine uh, do we need to review whether that's actually achieving the ultimate objectives and, and what do we mean by achieving justice even that is is you know something that should be looked at and I think sometimes the, these power symbols of them become just habits. And that's part of the point of, of what we're doing with, with safe justice is questioning whether we need to continue with the ways in which we're working or whether we need to first of all look at um, what are the needs of the participants in this system and then organize the organize solutions around them and I think w with disability issues what also we forget is that if you get your system right for them you get it right for everyone actually there's there's so many people who will benefit from the same solutions as as, as would victims with disabilities so um, I, I think that there's so much about what you say and trying to pull some of these things apart and and question it We're, we've got used to a justice system operating in a certain way Nobody wants to rock the boat. It's already like, well, it's already taking too long to make justice work. 
well, we need to ask these questions because I think otherwise we're ev there's so many people that will be dissatisfied with the system. Yes, and, and maybe when, when I add, I, I was long part of that system, not with, with a wig, but uh, without a wig, but it's the same system, I think. But I think it's very important because I don't believe that there are working people who, who don't want to know, but they have a sort of a blindness, you know, so it's very important to have the conversation with all the professional professional part parties, if I may say. And uh, I think you can do it in training together. Mm -hmm. That I th think can be very successful. I think also this afternoon, the stories of the people here behind the table um, uh, makes a lot of an impression. And, what my organization in the Netherlands did in, in the recent past is that we made a white book, so not a black book, as you know, with all bad examples, with, with good examples. And we were quite successful with this white book because we told them what they did well, but only one judge did it or one prosecutor or one policeman did it. And we gave them the example, you can do that in every, every procedure. So I think... <laughs> I think also with the safe justice paper, a lot of work has to be done, I think. And um, yes, you need brave people who start to do things because it's also a power network. So, uh, but people have to look in the, in the mirror. So, uh. no, thank you very much. I, I very much like this white book idea. I think finding ways to reach people and connect. Um, yeah. Do you want to say yeah. it? Yeah. Yes. I agree with you. I like the sound of that white book as well. Um, somebody once said, um, when you go into a court, you're going to get law, not necessarily justice. But of course, what you're talking about and a lot of the people we speak to as well, the injustices are happening long before you get to court. Um, just not being listened to, um, just not being. I think there's a big difference between hearing and listening. And somebody can tell their story to, you know, a policeman or whoever, but being heard is very different. And I think that's the initial injustice. And the people you describe, I can only imagine how disempowered they feel and it just doesn't even bear thinking about. But they're, they're I don't know where you, where you work, what country do you work in? Okay, 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 because it sounds like a situation where there, there ought to be a very strong network of NGOs who will, you know, be there initially for these people. And maybe again, training is, is important where at a, at a police level, that when they're confronted with a victim who has a disability of any kind, they would contact this NGO organization to represent them. And hopefully that might make a difference. Um, maybe just to pick up on this, I, I mean, that there's for me, there's three levels of change. One is at the personal or individual level, you know, a judge or a prosecutor has a power in their own rights. Um, but there's also the legal level and there's the infrastructural level. So when it comes to something like um, the ability of a victim with disability to uh, present their evidence to be believed in the courtroom, which is often some of the barriers that you experience, at least for me mental health, uh, men mental disability issues. It, you need to create a structure around those prosecutors and, and judges, which enables the victim to be heard. Because you, if you expect that, that a, a police investigator or someone will off their own just be able to make this happen it's not true you have tools you have you you have very clear methods by which you can enable someone to give their best evidence but you have to have that in place we've worked on facility dogs most recently but there's the use of dolls there's the interview rooms there are so many ways but th this is all about the structure around those people because I'm sure that prosecutors and lawyers who are listening to this are like, yes, but you have no idea. We have to get through 100 cases per X. How on earth am I supposed... So you need to have a structure which enables them to do their job, but also uh, meets the needs of victims. And, and actually, if you do both and you start introducing efficiencies with AI and other things, you'll be able to help victims, but also do that in a much more effective and efficient way. Thank you.
Yes, there is another question. Hello, everyone. I don't know if this person. Hello, my name is Lucas Stevenson. I work for the European Sex Worker Rights Alliance. We're a network of 100 organizations that provide services to people who work in the sex industry in Europe. I had like one comment and one question. Uh, I think like reflecting as well what you were saying, like we know for many marginalized communities, uh, accessing justice is still very, very difficult. And the first obstacle is that very few victims uh, will actually report to the police. In many cases, the police can uh, themselves be perpetrators of crimes. But also we know that, for example, for like trans people or for migrants or for sex workers, going to the police also brings lots of risk. And uh, I was recently like discussing with a colleague, a sex worker in, uh, in Portugal that was vic victim of domestic violence. And she was explaining that she had the courage to bring the case uh, to the police and then to the court where she was denouncing her husband who had been abusing her for many years. And when she went to court, the judge actually said, you deserved it, you're a sex worker. If I was your husband, I would have done the same thing. And this is the kind of example we hear as sex workers all the time. So I really applaud the work of Victim Support Europe in bringing uh, victims' voices to Europe. But I think there's so much more that needs to be done to tackle the stigma that some specific community face. And I wanted to ask like a more uh, specific question on uh, migrants' access to, uh, to justice. I feel that uh, for many undocumented migrants, we still know that it's very difficult to report in top, any form of crime because of uh, the risk of deportation. And I was happy to hear from Mr. Uh, Jose Diaz uh, that in the pro um, potentially anti-trafficking directive, there will be potential regularization of uh, victims of trafficking. And I was wondering if there is any more uh, work that is being done to ensure that undocumented migrants are able to access uh, justice to report crime like other citizens. Thank you. Um, I don't know what the, uh, I'm not up to speed on what precisely they're, they're proposing. There, there's the human trafficking directive, which is one aspect, but I don't think this is really what that's about. This is a different situation. Um, uh, I don't think it's clear for me how they're proposing to better protect um, victims in this situation. What we are saying as a starting point is that there needs to be a firewall system in place. Uh, in countries like Netherlands, they have a system. It's not perfect. But but the starting point is for, for victims to know that if they report the crime, their data is secure and won't be passed on to immigration authorities. So, so that's the starting point, I think. And that's something we're pushing for. I don't know whether the Commission will in include it in their proposal, but, but hopefully they will. And if not, of course, uh, we'll push for that in, in um, the uh, with the European Parliament as well. I think um, it, in terms of other legislation, I, I'm not aware of anything in there, but I think it's something which we've seen working with PICUM and with other organisations, uh, it's really critical. Uh, a big part of the report is on the ability to report, but then once you're in the system, um, how how do you take into account that the particular risks of that group are, and of each individual? So if you're, you know, a, a, as a migrant victim, if you're in a, it, it, your visa status may be put at risk. Um, if you report in a domestic violence situation, um, you, uh, your community may not be supportive of you. There are so many different levels in which un, uh, documented and undocumented migrants and asylum seekers are all prevented from reaching the system. And then when they're in the system, they face all sorts of prejudices. So those are all aspects of the safe justice system that we're pushing. We hope that the European Commission will incorporate some of these in their proposal. And we understand that uh, at least one part of uh, how they're approaching the solutions is to have a focus on the most vulnerable victims as well. Yeah, I just wanted to say something because we talked about the white book, so let's let's start now. <laughs> um, I wanted to say something about our experiences regarding uh, terrorism here in Belgium, uh, the attacks from 22nd of March. Uh, we had uh, a wonderful, a beautiful experience with, uh, with a case where an illegal person was sadly uh, a victim. Um, he was fully supported, uh, recognized and received the same rights as a Belgian citizen. So it is possible. I want to say this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> very short question. Is that possible? We need we need a translation because that's easier. Donc j'ai une question destinée à Monsieur Philippe. 
Euh, tout à l'heure, en fait, j'aimerais euh, rebondir sur euh, une petite phrase que vous avez... En fait, une petite phrase, un constat que vous avez fait tout à l'heure. I would, I would like to uh, go back to one sentence that you said before, Philippe. Corrigez-moi si je me trompe, mais j'ai l'impression que tout à l'heure, vous avez dit que quand une personne est victime de haine... Correct me if I'm wrong, but before you said that if a person is a victim of hate... Nous, il faut éviter d'avoir un sentiment de pitié. You shouldn't have pity for that person. Est-ce que c'est exact, c'est ce que vous avez dit tout à l'heure That's what you said before, right Yeah, I think for any victim, uh, pity is not the right answer. We need to provide support, but also the victims, the real work when you are a victim where you have been affected, the real work, only the victim itself or herself can do that resilience work. What society has to provide, what is in fact a duty, is to provide the right surrounding so that the victim can rebuild him or herself. And so pity is not a good, a good way. Parce que moi, dans mon cas personnel, justement, et euh, j'aurais tellement, tellement aimé pouvoir bénéficier d'un peu de pitié ou d'un peu d'empathie, justement. Empathie. Uh, in my personal case, I would have liked to receive a bit more empathy. Parce qu'il faut savoir que les crimes de haine, suivant qu'il s'agit d'un enfant, qu'il s'agit d'une femme, qu'il s'agit d'un noir, qu'il s'agit d'un blanc ou qu'il s'agit qu d'une un, trans ou un transsexuel ou d'un gay, l'attitude des gens n'est pas la même. Des gens qui, du moins, les gens qui assistent, leur réaction n'est pas du tout la même. For hate crime victims, if it's a child, uh, a woman, uh, an adult, a black or white person, the attitude of the people towards it is towards them is completely different. Different, tout à fait. Uh, I can fully hear what, what you are saying. Uh, I just want to point out that maybe it's an interpretation, but for me, th there is a difference between the empathy and yeah. and having pity. It's a huge difference. So maybe uh, we can afterwards uh, talk about how, how we see what is the difference between empathy and pity. But empathy, of course, we need to have empathy. We need to have respect. We have to keep this human contact and this human approach. It's really necessary for the victims, but, but not the pity. But I can justement. Mais justement, dans mon, voilà, mm -hmm. dans mon cas, c'est l'indifférence, la plus totale. Okay. Les gens yeah. assistent, yeah. mais ils ne réagissent pas. Ils regardent. Mm. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we come we come to the to the last part of the program. But I like to to thank our panelists, the people in the panel, for their contribution, because I I, I think it's every time um, um, you need the power and you need um, the energy to sit here and to tell your story. And I understand very well that of course it's very important to, to tell the story, but sometimes relatives and victims tell me that at the end of the day, it's, it's also quite emotional because you, you went into the story again and it's a sort of, um, yeah, again, go to the whole, whole story. So thank you that you, that you want to be here and uh, to share it with us because I think we can see how important it is to be here together and to see what kind of work has to be, has to be done. Um, we sit here in the, in the framework of, uh, of in the, in the, in the context of uh, the European day or week of, uh, of the victim uh, of a crime. But I think as we sit here and as we do our work, or if you are a, re a relative or a victim yourself, I think it's every day Victims' Day, and and that's very important. I think to keep it that in in mind because uh, I think that's an important beginning of uh, of uh, of next steps. And I always say myself uh, when I uh, when I'm I'm allowed to talk in my, own, in my own country to politicians or whatever people that it's it's a sign of a civilized society. Uh, which treats his victims in a very good way, I, uh, I, I think, because I think we have to ensure there is no victim who is not seen, who is forgotten, and uh, who has no voice. And I think that's very important to, to bring that in every day. And thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you.